Watercolor, part one. Watercolor is interesting. For some reasons, it's the easiest, most accessible way to paint. For other reasons, though, it can be the most difficult, least forgiving painting medium. Wait, what does medium mean when we're talking about art? To put it simply, a medium is the type of art material that you are using to make your art. So if I were to ask you, what medium do you like best? You could answer, my favorite medium is glitter and glue, or my favorite medium is watercolor. If you can't pick just one as your favorite, you could say, I like to use lots of different media. We don't say mediums. Okay, back to business. Before we start messing around with these watercolors, there's an artist we need to talk about. His name is Bill Trailer. I think that every American should know this artist's name, and there's really no other artist I would say that about. Bill Trailer was born as an enslaved person around the year 1853 in rural Alabama. After the Civil War and emancipation, he continued farming as a sharecropper on the plantation he had grown up on as a slave. It was not an easy life, and after over 50 years of toiling in the fields and living through the racist brutality of that time, Trailer, who was in his 80s, could no longer farm. He moved to the city of Montgomery, and without a job, became homeless. That's when Trailer, who could only write his name, began drawing and painting all this amazing artwork. No one taught him how to draw or paint. He taught himself. We call that type of artist self-taught. Part of Trailer's genius is in how he is able to use simple, flat shapes to create paintings with such vibrancy and movement. His paintings also tell the important history of the time between the end of slavery and the Civil Rights Movement. What was happening to black people in Alabama and all over the United States was truly horrifying. Trailer often painted about these things that were happening, but he used symbols and didn't paint them directly. If he did, he could have been in danger from white people who did not like black people bringing up such things. He made over a thousand pieces of artwork from the time he started painting, when he was over 80 years old, to when he died at the age of about 95. His work didn't become famous until many years after he died. Last year, this painting, Woman Pointing at Man with Cane, sold for $396,500. Do some research and check out more of Trailer's work. He's an artist that we need to pay attention to. I'm guessing that Trailer chose watercolor as one of his painting media because you don't need that many supplies to get started, and you certainly don't need to have all the different types of brushes. Most of the time, you can use just one or two different brushes, but it's kind of fun to see the different types. Most of the brushes are named for the shape the bristles make. The calligraphy brush is actually my new favorite, but we're going to save that for when we use ink in another episode. The wash brush is good for, well, the wash technique. And the mop is good for getting the paper good and wet when you need to, like when we do the wet on wet technique. On to a little necessary vocabulary. Transparent, translucent, and opaque. These three words tell us how an object does or does not let light pass through it. This glass is transparent. We can see right through it to this slightly embarrassing picture of me and my sister in high school. If I wanted to hide this picture, I shouldn't use watercolor because it does not block out light. It is a transparent painting medium. We could also call it translucent. Translucent is when something is hard to see through, but light is still able to pass through it, making it look like it's glowing. This is what makes watercolors beautiful. 
but it's also part of what makes them difficult to work with because you can't really cover up your mistakes with another layer of paint. This is acrylic paint, and it is more opaque. See how easily I can cover up this silly picture? Phew! Things that are opaque do not let light pass through them. I want to show you the difference between transparent and translucent. This window is completely transparent. You can see through it easily. Now, I will use my powers to See how it is more difficult to see through? But you can still see the glowing light passing through. That's translucent! Don't worry, no one's taking a bath. But this puppy sure needs one. Hey, get out of there! While I catch this little rascal, Here's a little song to help us remember those three words having to do with light. Transparent, translucent, opaque. Transparent, translucent, opaque. Transparent, translucent, opaque. Transparent, translucent, opaque. Back to Artemis. If you don't have watercolor paper or drawing paper, you can use regular computer paper. It doesn't work as well, but it still works. It's best to tape down your paper to a piece of cardboard or something like that. If you don't, the paper will curl, which is annoying, but not that big of a deal. You can always flatten it later. The tape also makes a nice white border around your painting when you're finished. Let's use our handy dandy subject matter spinner to help us pick out what we'll start painting. Awesome, I do love me a landscape. Let's start with what I think is the most basic technique. If you've ever painted with watercolor, this is probably what you did. You get your brush wet, and you swirl it on a color. The more you swirl, the more intense and opaque the color will be. The more water you use, the lighter and more transparent the paint will be. It is called wet on dry because your brush is wet, but the paper you are painting on is dry. Remember, it's usually best to work with light colors first. Then, you can put darker colors on top. That purple line on the right is a little too dark for the beginning of a painting, but that's okay, it's just in a small spot. Before we learn about the next technique, let's say hi to Anne-Marie Ventura, an artist who used watercolors to help her through a time when she was stuck indoors. Sound familiar? I uh, was in the middle of a hurricane in Texas, um, Hurricane Harvey, and I was stuck in my apartment for nine days while the water receded. There were a lot of animals coming inside people's homes uh, after Hurricane Harvey, just trying to find refuge, and um, that image sort of stuck with me, and I began to paint these interior spaces um, with birds inside. I think the key for me for watercolor is really a good drawing. Um, unless you just want to play, which is always good too. I usually make a big mess, which is why I needed a space in my home to do this. And it's really been an important thing for me to keep doing. Look at that reflection in the mirror. So beautiful. Hmm. I wonder if she used the wet on wet technique in that spot. The wet on wet technique is where you get the paper wet with water before you paint on it. It's called wet on wet because your brush is wet and the paper is wet. After you've wet the paper in the spots that you want it to, you can mix the color you want on a plastic lid or a palette. Then just dip your brush with the paint on it, 
onto the wet paper. Watch the color spread. Add a different color and watch them diffuse and mix. I love this part. Can you see where watercolor artist Emma Larson uses this technique in her beautiful abstract paintings? The next technique is called dry brush. First, get your brush a little wet and swirl on a color. Then use a paper towel or rag to dry off almost all the water so that your brush is mostly dry, but still has some paint in the bristles. Then push down and rub with your brush. This technique gives a good scratchy texture that's good for lots of things, like sand or a rocky mountain in the distance. For the next technique, let's look at how fourth grade Binghamton artist Shaira made the background colors in this beautiful landscape. She used the wash technique to make those three bands of light color. Then she painted on top of them. This technique is a good way to start a painting. It would also be considered another wet on dry technique, like the first one we looked at. When using a wash, make sure to mix lots of water with your paint so that it is nice and transparent. Can you tell where Alanis, another fourth grade Binghamton artist, used the wash technique in this fabulous figure painting? Can you see where she used the dry brush technique? How many different techniques can you fit in one watercolor painting? Or maybe you just want to focus on one technique. That's up to you. It's your painting. It's your world. The second to last watercolor technique we'll learn about in this episode is called the mask technique. Simply choose some areas of your painting to cover with masking tape. Then paint on top of it. When it's dry, take off the tape and you will reveal the colors that you have masked underneath. You can use masking tape or a special masking liquid called frisket. Can you see where Ian and Salem used masks in their abstract watercolor paintings? Here, I am using that liquid masking stuff called frisket, but I don't want to take it off this painting until watercolor episode two. So here, you can see me using masking tape and liquid frisket on this other painting. Be careful when you're taking off your tape and your frisket, or you'll rip the paper. Smartest artist question, what was the subject matter of the art TV painting that you just looked at? If you guessed text, that's correct. A text painting is a painting where words are the main subject. In this technique, you draw on your paper with crayons, then paint over it with watercolor. The watercolor won't cover the crayon because water slides off of wax. This method is called wax resist, and it's a lot of fun to do on its own. Grab some white paper, draw a picture, any picture, like first grade artists Jules and Ethan did here. Great job, boys. Then paint over it, like artists Genesis and Lucas did in these striking wax resist paintings. Make sure to push down pretty hard with the crayon so you're leaving a lot of wax on the paper. Then, swirl your brush on the paint with lots of water, getting a lot of paint and water in there. Then, brush the paint over the crayon drawing. You don't really want to keep brushing over the same spot. Just brush once and move on, or else you'll rub off the wax and the crayon won't be able to push that watercolor off of it. I'm using black paint so that you can see the effect most clearly. Before we wrap up this episode, let's take a look at some of the amazing art that artists have sent in. Whoa, look at these observation drawings of little plastic toy animals. Great color blending, Jonathan and Alexis. Next, we have artists Ian and Carson with precise observation drawings of items from nature. And oh, even our librarian, Mrs. Evans. Look at that detail on that planter. Landon and Carson, artists from Endwell, New York, 
made these stunning found object sculptures. And finally, we have two artists from Dryden, New York, who created their own scratch paper and used shapes and lines to create two masterful drawings. Thank you all for sending in your artwork and keep doing it. If you discover your own art making technique, please let me know so I can learn from you. Stay kind and creative. See you next time.